chat and I can hello. say hello to everybody and kind of get this going. Um, Melissa, is that you? Hi. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice Thank to see you. everyone. Really nice to see everyone. Since we have like a, just a nice little group of folks here, I'd actually like us to take a moment, and this is a social after all. It's our second social, so we're just figuring out the format and how to bring everyone in and be really social virtually. And I'm sure you all have been attending a lot of virtual um, gatherings, so you may have some ideas. I try not to spend too much time on the computer, so I'm open to suggestions. But what I was thinking of trying, at least, is letting everybody say hello, give their name. Maybe I will, um, I'll call roll a little bit, and then you can jump in with your name. We're here for playful plant breeding today with Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and friends and special guests and um, if everybody could say their name, where they're calling in from, and how about something like a seed that you are uh, have either planted recently, hopefully some of you are getting out there in the soil or doing some starts like Sherry was on her great video, which I loved. Um, so maybe just mention quickly your name, where you're from, and a seed that you have planted recently or you're about to plant or you're excited to plant. And um, well, I'm going to go across my screen. Bill's right next to me, so I'm going to to uh, ask Bill first, and he's our executive director of Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. I think that we know most folks here, but I'll do intros like that anyway, just to make sure everybody knows who's who a little bit. Bill, what's your, where are you at? Well, um, it just, I was going to tell Joseph, um, he had three inches of snow. It melted today. Is that what you, yeah. <laughs> you, were, you were telling me? It was um, 75 here today, and this is really this morning was one of our first warm mornings. You know, it finally wasn't cold. And so um, I've actually, I'm testing nature and I've planted tomatoes outside already. Just, to, just seeing if it'll, you know, it's possible everything will get wiped out anytime. We get one of those already cold things, but, um, and, the tomato, and the tomato I'm most excited about planting, um, well, there's a couple of them. One is I planted some galena from Siberia and I found some 1999 seed and it uh I got over 90 percent germination wow and then I'm also planting a uh, Grushovka which is another Siberian uh, one of my old favor favorites and I realized the other day that um in a since 1980 I have never grown it for pleasure for me to eat it, it was always for seed and so I'm kind of going through this catharsis where I realize I'm giving myself permission to actually grow tomatoes to eat. <laughs> I mean, in, in my yard, it was always, my whole life, it's been like, don't touch that, right? Because there's five to $10 mm -hmm. worth of seeds in every tomato, right? <laughs> Nobody could eat them. Nobody could use them for anything because I needed the seed. And so, so now I get to grow them to, uh, <laughs> and so, and I ordered some seed from uh, Miss Penn to uh to plant because she's been a great steward of those and they're different than mine so i'll get to try both and and measure and see if um there's any drift over the years so that's what i'm doing oh how fun and seed from 1999 so there we go goes to show you because what do they say on tomato seed how long the storage usually is on that shorter by mm -hmm. yeah by the, yeah what we read but bill is always um <laughs> challenging the system i love it <laughs> so how about so now i'm just going to go across my screen i think our screens show up differently but joseph i i see you next so how about and joseph is our special guest this evening you all are special guests we invited joseph to come in and talk about playful plant breeding but joseph what's something that you're planting or excited about right now to plant so my snow melted about two and a half weeks ago and so I got out and I planted lettuce and onion and favas and a few other cold loving things. And then I planted some warm weather beans just because I'm, I'm plant breeding with them and trying to select for frost tolerance. Um, the onions that I planted are actually some shallots that I got at the seed summit down in uh, Santa Fe from Jeanette. Um, Hartman, and so they they've grown one year in my garden now, and they were 
they're really productive for me and they they've stored perfectly without any sprouting so that's a, a really beautiful onion of course they don't make seeds and so i can only clone them but you do what you can do <laughs> awesome and joseph is joining us from i'm joining from paradise utah yes. actually i'm joining you from my bedroom and see how nice and clean it is <laughs> I got nice. tired of being a mess head and about three weeks ago and so I cleaned and I've been loving keeping a perfectly clean bedroom. I it just want like I just won't turn the camera around and show you the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. It looks like a seed sanctuary. It makes me really it happy. It is. <laughs> it's a total seed sanctuary. <laughs> oh. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. Thank you. You know how to rock the seed social. I'm, I'm going to have to dress mine up a little bit more next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only, I only am putting on a show because you said I was a presenter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we love, love your shows, Joseph. I'm so happy to have you with us. <laughs> Melissa, I see you next. And it's so nice to see you. I met Melissa, I guess couple years ago now at our seed school teacher training she could have taught the mm -hmm. course she's rocking the seed no. world in florida and um i hear a lot of everything you're doing but tell us where you're coming in from and what you're excited about um so gainesville florida north central florida and for us it's been a really warm winter this year it was actually feeling like summer a few weeks ago we got a little breath of cool air this week, so it's nice. It's probably our last hurrah before it's hot, hot, hot. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, I had a lot of cool things. It's hard to narrow down what's exciting. Um, I got some cool seeds from Doug Jones in North Carolina last fall. So I'm growing out a, I don't know exactly what it is. It's a hybrid that's kind of stabilized that he calls Senpose that he got from Fedco and it's a cabbage crossed with an Asian mustard. Oh, cool. So I grew that out for fun and it's producing seeds. So I'm playing around with that. And our tomatoes are already three feet tall. I got a bunch of different ones. We're mostly doing seed saving on them. Um, I'm kind of like Bill. I'm growing for seed all the time that I forget to eat things sometimes. So I'm giving myself permission this year oh, nice. <laughs> to eat food. Um, I got some really cool beet seeds from Chris Hubbard at the Organic Seed Growers Conference that were indigenous varieties from Florida. And only three of them came up out of only eight. So I guess that's not too bad. So those I'm protecting like precious little rare babies, put little rabbit fencing around them. And every day I go talk to them because I'm scared to death, they'll die. <laughs> um, what did you say they were? They were a couple of different bean varieties. One mm. is a wild bean and the other one is a really tiny seed. And then the other one looks just like a, you know, regular Fasciolus vulgaris. But um, one is actually from this area, from the Paynes Prairie area, from the, uh, um, not the Miccosukee, that's the one I have from South Florida, um, from another tribe from up here. I can't recall the name offhand. And I'm going to play around with garlic seed breeding why not this year i have one good variety that i really like and someone at the seed growers conference inspired inspired me to save garlic seed instead of just saving the bulbs to clone i have no idea what i'm doing but i'm gonna figure it out wow fantastic will you keep us posted on that i'm i always I am, i'm curious myself and i know um i hear from a lot of other people that are curious about doing that too and i i bet some other folks on here have some some knowledge too so those are things yeah. that we should share info on thank you melissa mm -hmm. danielle you're next on my screen and it's nice to see you there you and i have been email buddies but i have never seen your face before so thanks for joining us and really nice to see your beautiful smile oh thank you sorry i'm i've got my hat on my glasses on because i'm sitting outside in the garden i just got done with some work so this seemed like the best place to to have the meeting mm -hmm. was out here so Sorry yeah. if you can't see, see, really see me, but this is actually what I look like most of the time anyway. <laughs> Thanks for bringing but us I, inside with you. Tell us where you're yeah, at and what you're working on. You know, if I could figure out how to work the camera better, I could almost kind of show you some of the plants, but <laughs> <laughs> including the salvias. 
Oh, good. Yeah, so um, that's one of the ones I'm really excited about. Leanne sent me some um, chia, the Salvia Hispanica, and I, put, I planted them, it's probably been about a month now, and I had, um, I had almost 100% germination inside, you know, under my grow lights, and then I just started uh, transplanting them outside in the last week or so, and they're doing really well. It'll be interesting to see once it gets hotter, um, you know, how they do, because I'm, I'm, I'm in Scottsdale, so I'm in a pretty hot area, and I, I don't know a lot about, I think they're um, Mexican, you know, they're Mexican natives, but I've never seen them growing in this part of the Sonoran Desert. So it'll be interesting to see how they do once it gets up into the 90s and beyond. Um, but I'm really looking forward to that because I think that's going to be a great plant to grow here. Um, a couple of things I've been growing. Um, I'm starting a garden for our students on campus. And um, I've been trying to come up with some of the things you're going to be most likely to eat. <laughs> and so I found um, personal size cantaloupes and personal size watermelons that I thought might be you know, because it's kind of a, maybe a one, you know, something you can have as a snack or a treat in one setting or serving. So I just started those and I've got some germination. So that's been pretty cool. And most of what I do grow though is native plants that are not necessarily um, food plants. So that's a lot of what's behind me right now. <laughs> nice. And is that the, by the way, did I give you the chia from Joseph Loft House? Do you know? Oh, you know what? I have to go back to the envelope. I oh, I have to go back in my brain and to my yeah. Notes. If I've I been know. circulating yours, just so you know, and here's Joseph. So if you are, then you two have virtually met, but you've already met uh -huh. through. Well, thanks. I I know that the other chia that you gave me, the annual chia, I'm pretty sure that came from Joseph last okay. year, but okay. this one I'm not sure. This is the perennial one. I'm not sure where it came from. I'll have to double check. And I think I had a perennial and an annual from Joseph, and then I had some from Evan. So, um, yeah, keep us posted on that. Thank you so much, Danielle. Really great to see you out there. Jackie, you're That's next right. on my screen. I'm so glad that you got in through whichever doorway you entered. <laughs> I think I came through a couple different doorways, so I'm on here twice. Renee and I both are, so it's fine. What's Fantastic. the question again? So where you're coming in from, and Jackie's our operations coordinator at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. We have more and more folks coming in now, so I guess um, I guess we'll be kind of quick uh, with these intros. So where you're calling in from, and what you have planted or are excited to plant? Oh, okay. Well, I've been Flagstaff, Arizona, and so far the seeds I've started are a whole bunch of different peppers about. 18 varieties of tomatoes and so I'm like Bill I'm just excited to eat a bunch of tomatoes this year. <laughs> That's fantastic thank you. Hey Greg Shane I see you next. I'm presuming that's Greg Shane. Yeah I don't have my camera working right now. I'm here. You're here and you're coming yeah. in from tell us where you're coming in from and what you're excited to plant. Well, I just got all this, the uh, grain trial seeds from Leanne just today, and those are going in tomorrow. And uh, I'm right in the middle of New Mexico. I've relocated to Estancia, and that's where we've got a seed bank out here. So uh, it's getting exciting. I'm, you know, expanding the gardens where I'm at. So uh, that's, what, that's what's going on right now. Looking forward to it. Fantastic. Greg's going to join us at the last seed social of this month and um, he'll be our guest for the spirit of seeds. So we're looking forward to that and thanks for jumping on today too, Greg. Jerry, I have you next on my screen. How's it going? Where are you coming in from and what are you excited about? Hi everybody. Uh, I am calling from my house in Denver, Colorado and we just started to get some more spring snow today here. I went out for a quick brisk walk before it's coming down and I can see my backyard a little and it, it's sticking um, but classic Rocky Mountains it'll be 70 on Sunday so <laughs> this is how we do it here in the, the high altitude. Um, I did a bunch of seed starting over the weekend and I noticed today when I was checking on them that some of my lettuce is starting to pop up already so that's very exciting. Um, and I also ordered some lovely tomatoes from our dear friend, Penn, 
so I'm uh, I'm most excited to grow some Sasha Altai, some Sasha's Altai. Um, Penn sent me a wide diversity of seeds, but I'm excited about that. And um, it's also been really fun. Uh, a lot of my friends are asking me where to buy their seeds. You know, people are really re-engaging with this work. And so it's been fun to share that information and also make little seed care packages for friends too with the seeds that I have. Um, so it's, uh, it feels good to be able to, to do that work as well. So happy to see familiar faces and be here with everybody. Wow, fantastic. That's Sherry Manning with Global Seed Savers. I didn't give you that proper intro. She's doing work in the Philippines here and just everywhere. Thanks, Sherry. I love that you're sharing the seeds the way you are. Renee, I see you next. What are you up to? And Renee is our um, social media guru, helping us keep all of these social media things afloat so we can get us all together. So yeah, tell us where you're at and what you're doing. Everybody, um, I am in Arizona, and I am brand new to seed starting, so these socials, I feel like I'm going to be benefiting so much from all of you, but this is the first season I have started from seeds, and I'm super excited. My scarlet runner beans are magnificent and uh, growing like crazy, and I love watching my nasturtium grow as well. But I have to say that my most favorite one that's just doing an outstanding job is my real grand blue corn. And I got them from the Great American Meetup last year. So I just loving the journey and watching and documenting everything that they're doing. I hope they're doing it right. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. I hope you will share some photos on our social media. I love nasturtium seeds, oh, wow. they like little brains, they're so smart. <laughs> <laughs> cool, Susanna, Susanna. Hi, I'm Susanna, um, I'm in Decorah, Iowa. Um, our ground is finally defrosting, so we're getting there. Um, a seed that I'm super excited about is um, a dehybridized dirty girl. Um, that I got from out in California, um, and I'm excited to, to give it a whirl over here. Wow, thanks so much, and thanks for joining us from Decorah, Iowa. That's fun. Danielle, I see another Danielle. Hi, I'm Danielle, and I'm in um, Albany, Vermont, um, and our house is on the market, and everything's in boxes, but uh, sometime this weekend, I'm going to go out and find all my seeds, and I a bag of dirt even though we're not gonna have a garden this year because we'll likely be moving i'm gonna make some starts anyway because it's crazy being all locked up in the house together so i'm just excited to be here and listen to everyone else wonderful did you say you're in vermont i am wow fantastic where in vermont i didn't hear you oh i'm in albany vermont okay. um, it's it's near Craftsbury, which is where Sterling College is. So I actually saw Bill there a year or two ago when you were on a panel and the, um, Tom Stearns moderated. It was a very fun evening. Yeah, fantastic. I was blessed to be there too. I love Vermont. That was a great experience. Thanks for joining us, Danielle. And I see a Mel. Mel, we are checking in, saying hello from uh, wherever we're from and talking about something we're excited to grow or something that we've already planted. Oh, that's our, that's Melissa. Is that me? Yeah, I think that's it's you. It comes across as Mel and then I didn't see your face so um, I wasn't putting it together. Okay, I think that, that we have everybody and I'm coming in from uh, Mancus, Colorado, southwest corner of Colorado. I'm the program director and I'm really excited to host this show with uh, on playful plant breeding. And Bill, I better turn it over to you, but it was really fun to kind of do the social thing here at the beginning. We um, just some of the protocol that we're trying to work with is that you, if you want to do comments during the presentation, we have a, the chat room. I can't see mine, but we have a chat room and um, Jackie's kind of, runs that right Jackie are you going to be yeah. sharing information with us there we'll tag team that and um, then at the end after we hear from Bill and Joseph then we can have some more conversation if we have some time so Bill I'll turn it over to you now there we go 
Um, if you just push the chat button at the bottom of your screen, uh, a box will um, show up on the right side and you can type messages in on the bottom. And that's how we'll see them. Um, I'm really not gonna say a lot except um, um, that um, I just wanna tell the story of how Joseph Lofthouse came into our lives. And because it, we were talking about this earlier, we were the only two on and um, it's just been a wonderful gift in both directions, one of those things. And I'd heard about Joseph and we tried to get him, we were doing a seed school in Southern Idaho and we tried to get Joseph to come. And uh, we heard through uh, Greg Batt and some people at the Ogden Seed Exchange about this extraordinary seed saver. And um, we tried and tried and things weren't looking very good. And so I said, it doesn't matter, go get him. <laughs> if you can, if somebody's driving through there or send him gas money or whatever it takes, but we've got to have Joseph. I'd love to have him come. And I didn't know him at the time, but I just had this feeling that people like that, you know, like Joseph. And we found several people, but of all of them, Joseph's the most extraordinary. He came to seed school. And I have to say, we've done over 40 seed schools now since 2010. We've lost track. You know, I'm, we need someone who wants to go back through all the the notes and, and compile a list for us. But in those 40 seed schools, nobody has ever come to seed school. And uh, certainly nobody's ever been there on the staff or whatever that could answer every question that was asked until Joseph came. <laughs> and, and I sat in wonder listening to his answers, it, it, you know, on a bio uh, mechanical uh, levels all the way up to modern genetics to spiritual questions. I mean, it was just phenomenal. So uh, you won my heart over then, Joseph, and I've been following, I've been one of your, one of the people that follow you around ever since. So we're really honored to have you here because in a way I heard, um, I watched your YouTube presentation at Organic Seed Alliance. And when we talked about doing this and, and calling it playful plant breeding, it just seemed like those two things lined up. Exactly. It seemed like that was the primary message that you were trying to get at the organic seed lines, which is not always a popular message there. And so thank you for giving that. And am I right about that? And tell us what you were trying to say that day and, and what you really think playful plant breeding is. So, so if I have a message about playful plant breeding, it would be that the plants have been doing this breeding stuff for thousands, millions of years before we ever came along. They know how to do it. And all we need to do is just get out of their way and let them do what they really do well. And, and if we try to separate them from each other and, and inbreed them so bad that they, they forget how to deal with the bugs and the, and the diseases, that, then that's, our problem and the plants what they want to do is they just want to get and mix things up and try hundreds and thousands of different varieties to see which one works in any particular area and so they're having a lot of fun being promiscuous and and i say get out of the way and let them do that yeah, but but you're saying this as a as a you know what's what I think has happened is that so many of us are coming from you know an industrial academic you know logical point of view, and so when we when we look at everything else in the world that we do, you know whether we're doing math problems, taking care of our checking accounts, or we're trying to write new computer programs, we have a completely different way of going about it. We've got to be in control. We have to understand the problem. We have to design, you know, we have to have a goal. We have to design a way to get to that goal. And then we have to be rigorous about getting there. And what you're saying is that, that even if we want to, you know, the goal is the same. We want a lot of food for a lot of people. We want to feed everybody. You're saying that 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 control side of things isn't necessary. Correct. Necessary. Well, well, see, when I when I first started plant breeding, I had previously worked for 20 years as a chemist. And so, in a chemical laboratory, you have rules, you have procedures, you keep records. You keep more records and you keep more records and you control everything and you grow con or you do controls and so you have this big you know this just rigorous 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 and what i realized when i started plant breeding is that 
I was in the wrong personality occupation because my personality is really more of an artist and I was doing scientist work. And so when I started doing plant breeding as an artist, saving seeds from what I love, what brings me joy, and, and stop fussing with all of the record keeping, all of a sudden I found out that I could grow twice as much food because I was spending half of my time in the garden keeping records of what I was planting, what I was harvesting. I was putting labels on things when I planted them, when I harvested them. All of a sudden I could grow twice as much food or I could grow half as much food and play for the same amount of time. And, and so that really, and then once I had that realization, it's like, well, I'm doing that in every part of my garden. And, and so it brings me a lot of joy. Um, it also brings a little bit of sadness because I have my ego that sits on my shoulder from my, my culture and my, and, and my peers. And, and sometimes I, I just don't have an answer when people says, well, where does this come from? It's like, well, I don't know. It's just, it just happens. <laughs> but do you really believe, you know, the sense I get from you is that you're actually coming up with better varieties. And I, you're, you know, your land raised seeds is kind of famous for that. And, and I know that you've passed them out to some of the best plant breeders in the country now. So it's not as though you're just making a mess and that's all you have. <laughs> well, well, see, the thing that happens is if I grow a variety in my, at my place and it grows poorly, it doesn't make seeds. And so that, that variety gets just eliminated automatically from the gene pool without me having to do any effort. And, and then what I end up with is I end up with the best of the best varieties. And so when, and if I can encourage the best of the best to cross pollinate with each other a little or a lot, then children tend to resemble their, their parents and their grandparents. And so I tend to get great vegetables and I certainly get stuff that is super locally adapted. It, it knows what my soil is, it knows what my bugs are, it knows what the sunlight is here, it knows what the water's like, it knows what I'm like as a farmer. Um, one of the things I find most joyful about um, growing my own seeds is that I taste every fruit before I save seeds from it. And I've been doing that for a decade. And all of a sudden, what that means is that fruit is exactly what I love to eat. The smells, the taste, the texture, they're, they're like part of my body because that's what the plants have given to me because that's what I've asked for for generation after generation. And that's really joyful yeah. to, to eat something that you know, it's basically, it's one with my body. Wow. Well, you know, and I guess, so if you try to act like a professional plant breeder and, and have preconceived ideas about what you're going to select for, and this requires some record keeping, Obviously, um, what I, I seem to hear you say is that that would get in the way of well, this, this local natural adaptation, because I might be selecting for things that aren't as adapted to right here and the bugs and the soil and the, or the flavors that you like. Is that, is that a, am I characterizing that correctly? So if, if you are saving seeds in your garden, year after year, you're doing selection. You might not know what you're selecting for, but you're doing selection. For example, I used to, I noticed one year that my tomatoes, they grow up like this, and then they come back down and, and anchor onto the ground, and the fruit of them is up here on this, this top part of the vine, and it's not down here in the mud. 
and that was an inadvertent selection I was doing because I don't want to pick a tomato that's all muddy and dirty and rotten on the ground. And so I was inadvertently selecting for that, those arching vines that kept the tomatoes up off of the ground. Wow. And, you know, I, I wasn't intending to do that, but it just happened. Right. Well, and this is where the word playful comes in. Uh -huh. If you're out and joyful and playing in your garden, and picking the tomatoes you like, you, you are inadvertently selecting sometimes. That's what you're saying. Right. And, and the, the inadvertent selection happens best if there's a little bit of crossing going on. It doesn't have to be much. Like on, on beans, the crossing rate might only be one in a hundred. But still, if I, if I pay attention and I look and I see what's there, I'll see beans that are different. They grow better. They have a color that pleases me. Um, they might have a different texture when I cook them. But but just if I, you know, blah, blah, if I just enjoy what's out there, I can see those hybrids and and plant more of them next year if there's something that, that I love. Wow. Well, you know, it seems to me, I, I'm just going to say this for everybody that's on that isn't really familiar with all of the things that we do, but, um, you know, that's heresy. You know? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in some circles, it's like, oh, I'm looking for the cross, you know, because, you know, the, the, uh, the heresy would be delivered in, oh, my gosh, Joseph, those did not breed true. Okay, right. so I have, a, I, Go I have an example here. So I have a delicata squash, uh, regular old delicata. I have an acorn squash, regular old acorn squash, and I have a hybrid between them. Wow. Guess what? Every one of these tastes beautiful. Every one of them smells beautiful when I cook it. And this, this hybrid, didn't turn into a monster. You know, I, I started with great parents, I get great offspring. And, and that's pretty much, I've never had a variety return to monster state or to a wild state, unless I purposefully crossed it with a wild variety. Because there, there was one time I, like I, I planted a wild watermelon. And so what I ended up getting was, I got watermelons that would explode when the sun hit got on them, you know, which, which isn't really a nice trait for a watermelon. And so I had to, I had to select against that, but it took, you know, two or three generations and that trait was, had just disappeared again. Well, so you're saying that um, we shouldn't be afraid. Don't be afraid, be joyful, <laughs> be happy. <laughs> Well, you know, um, I, I mean, I think, and this is one of the things that took me years to understand is that most gardeners come into this with that fear. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm not going to do the right thing. It's not going to be, and they use words like true. It's not going to be true, right? I've had right. people at the Pima County Seed Library when we first helped them get it going and a woman came up to me, a master gardener and said, Bill, 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 we've got a real problem. I said, what's that? She said, people are actually starting to check seeds back into the library. And we don't know. And, and we don't know, you know, if they're true. And, and I said, well, what's the problem? And she looked at me like I was from a different planet. Uh -huh. And I understand why. And so it took me a while to, to find an explanation for her. Is, but, you know, she is right. If you are doing large-scale industrial agriculture, where you need uniformity and predictability. If that means, you know, to the third decimal place, you're going to make more money or aren't because your customers won't recognize what you grow or it comes at a different time or it doesn't ripen at all at the same time, all the things right. that we need uniformity for, then that is a crime, you know? They right. do need true. But for us to, to live our lives and grow our own food, you seem to be the best example, at least in my life, I found of somebody who settled down into that mentally and has accepted what's going on and actually now are learning to thrive in that. And that's what I love about what you're saying. Uh, 
It was so frightening for me when I started mixing varieties together. <laughs> I mean, what? What did I call that? I mean, it's a winter squash. <laughs> uh, uh, I got a reputation at the farmer's market that any food that I sold was going to taste beautiful and it was going to smell beautiful and so people didn't have to worry about buying something that they'd never saw before and 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 so that was a nice place to get to well so maybe what you're saying and and we could all think about this as we rebuild our food system after this crisis that we're in is that what you're saying is that if you're not in an industrial setting to buy your food if you can go and buy it from the person who grew it, then mm -hmm. it's easier for you to learn new things right. that will actually be better and easier, you well, know, for us to, to, to actually create new varieties again, you know, that need less inputs wherever we live. So I, I grow all of these together in the same field and I call them one variety. They're my, they're my pepo winter squash. And, and some of them might grow on vines and some of them might grow on bushes. But the trait that I value the most is their long keeping. Here it is, I'm, I'm gonna cut these open in a, in a month and take the seeds out and plant them that same day, maybe two months, but whatever it is. But, but they're all one variety for me. It's so simple and easy. I don't have to have three seed packets. I can keep one seed packet. Um, and, but, but the one trait that I care about is I care about flavor and I care about productivity. Mm -hmm. And I also care about whether or not a variety is able to make seeds, but that sort of takes care of itself automatically with the ecosystem. I don't, I don't have to worry about that. Wow, so practical problem that many new gardeners face and I've been kind of watching this Phoenix backyard gardener Facebook group you know and the questions come through and I'm from out of town can I plant now and what do I plant and which varieties and whatever and and it, it brought to mind this idea that I think that you're um, becoming an exponent for and that is instead of trying to keep things all lined up excuse me and straight and finding the variety that might work for you it may be better for you to get all the winter squashes uh -huh. <laughs> that you can find and mix them all together and plant them. Right. And see which one works. Let them select uh -huh. and find. And if you're lucky, and, to, and tell me if I'm saying this right, if you're lucky, some of them will cross and you'll actually come up with new combinations of things that nobody else has, nobody else has ever seen that the plants are putting forth, doing what they've done, as you said, for a million years. And that might be a practical way of getting to a better answer for you and your own winter squash in your own backyard. So, so the, the plants have um, genetic knowledge that has been stored in their DNA and each seed has a little bit of that genetic knowledge. And when we let seeds cross with each other, then then they can exchange that knowledge with them and see, oh, you have this part of the, the, you have the soil issue for down in Phoenix, but you have the, the temperature issue. And so you bring them together and you get the soil genetics and the, and the yeah. And, and I find when I'm, when I'm breeding my own varieties that the third year is the magical year because the, the first year I plant the varieties and most of them die or 75% die. And then the second year things do pretty good, but those survivors then end up crossing a little bit or a lot. And then that third generation, you've got the, the crosses between the best of the best and, and it, really, it really thrives from the third year on. So, so would you say then, um... If you're if you're advising new young gardeners that want to you know be world class, you know uh, varieties that work exactly where they are. You know we've got a generation that's studying permaculture now. A lot of people come out, you know, so they've got the right kind of um, 
philosophical understanding of the world and how they want to live in it. And that means taking care of themselves and creating food for us. So in order to do that, uh, would you say then um, get as many different kinds of varieties as you can that have grown in and around your area and mix them together and start your own experiment to try to find out what works best for you right where you are. Is that, is that uh, one, one strategy? Yes, and, and you don't have to do that all at once. Like one year you could grow two or three or four varieties. Mm -hmm. The next year you could add a variety. You know, you could add a variety the next year if you wanted. In, in small amounts, because a small amount of pollen isn't going to mess up your, your current population. And I, I mean, it might, like, I don't like mixing my sweet peppers and my hot peppers, you know, but, but I grow them in separate fields and then it's just fine. But in general, you know, a little bit of pollen will bring some diversity in without seriously affecting quality as long as you're, you know, somewhat careful. And, but certainly, even if you were just sort of growing a, an heirloom variety in your farm and trying to keep it pure, you would still be doing inadvertent plant breeding because there's a little bit of genetic diversity in that. And it and and some of those would be more adapted to your place, but when you get a little bit of crossing going on, then that's when the plants can really exchange information about how to grow better. So, how many different varieties of beans are in your uh, your famous bean mix? <laughs> so, I I w went to a seed conference a couple years ago. And there's this lady named Lisa Bloodnick, and I just love her. And she brought a thousand varieties of beans to the to the conference, and she had them on on tables in little racks that were like 50, 20 varieties per rack, and they were just filled up two tables. And then I also brought beans to, and she, yeah. So I also brought beans to the conference. And yeah, and and so um, she teased me and said that we both brought a thousand varieties of beans, hers all all in individual packets, and mine all in the same jar. And and that is pretty true about about what was happening. Um, and also. In addition to growing, like these are fava beans, for example, and and they're from like plant explorers that went to South America, and they're for from plant breeders uh, like Ianto up in uh, Oregon, I think, and just from commercial seed sources, and and so they're all growing together, and the ones that live on my farm get to live. But I, I grow like many different species of beans as well, like the favas and the lentils and the garbanzos, because that, that's another way to bring genetic diversity into my garden. And if they're all hot weather beans, like a runner bean and a, a pole bean, I wouldn't even care if, if all of those were in the same land race, <laughs> uh, because they, the common beans and the runner beans do cross, you know, from time to time. And so it, we like to to think of things as separate and distinct, and but biological systems tend to be fuzzy and they tend to be approximations. And so for me, it's beautiful if I get the species mixing it up a little bit too. How much how much have you noticed uh, fava beans crossing? Um, they often say they cross more than regular beans. I, I believe that the crossing rate on favas is up to twenty percent. Okay. And I actually planted my field this year so that I can answer that question. Okay. Because I sorted the fava beans before I planted them, and I planted up only purple ones and only small ones and only. Um, tan ones so that 
maybe by fall I'll be able to answer that more accurately. Okay, great. Well, does anyone else have questions? You know, th does that sound um, okay, Leanne, to start into questions? Or Jackie, I, have you been looking in the chat window? Anybody else have, have questions for Joseph? I, I mean, I just asked mine. I've always wondered how much more fava beans cross, so. What we're seeing in the chat window are the ahas. Lots of ahas coming in, Joseph. You do that to us. You inspire us with ahas, I think. We had someone say a lot of fun being promiscuous. Oh, Jackie said a lot of fun being promiscuous. Ha! <laughs> and a great message to be joyful from Sherry. So, yeah, I was thinking how this is like joyful plant breeding, as playful as it is. But what questions it. do people have? So, so before questions, I'd like to sing you a little song. Oh, good. Thanks for being joyful. Please. Um, this is what I, I love to sing when I'm working in my garden. And it goes like this. Mother, I feel you under my feet. Mother, I hear your heart beat. Mother, I feel you under my feet. Mother, I hear your heart beat. Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, yeah, hey, uh, hey, uh, ho. Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, ho. Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, yeah, hey, uh, hey, uh, ho. Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey. Anyway, so while I'm while I'm being playful in the garden, I have dozens of songs that I sing to to the plants and to myself, and uh, it's part of how I be playful in the garden. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for humoring me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for humoring us. <laughs> So how about some questions for Joseph? We have like 10 minutes here. I also would love to hear about people's playful plant breeding experiences and experiments, if anyone wants to share something like that. I'm gonna put a, a virtual background where I share an inspiration from Joseph and promiscuous beans. <laughs> but yeah, people, feel free to jump in. Uh this grain is a promiscuous grain. Um, in, in my garden, because it's so dry, we estimate that wheat crosses at about 10%. And so last spring, Leanne sent me 16 varieties that were the best varieties from the grain trials that she's running. And I planted them all about this far apart so that during the growing season, the the stems could bang against each other and exchange pollen more easily. And so, so I harvested lots and lots of promiscuous um, wheat and barley we, we were working on. And um, also a, another, the Occidental Arts and Ecology mm -hmm. sent us a population that had 2,000 varieties of wheat in it. I planted those as well. Um, that was one of those areas where I had a little bit of a failing as a farmer, but <laughs> but I, I still got some beautiful stuff, and I really need to send that to you, Leanne, in the near future. <laughs> well, you know, I do love to get those grains back, but it, the stories are equally fun for me to hear about. And Joseph has been having fun with our revolutionary grain um, mixes that we're starting to send out. We were inspired by Occidental in their evolutionary plant breeding program and so followed suit and threw a bunch of grains out there and uh, I knew Joseph would be a good candidate for those and it, he's been sending me some photos of this spring. It looks like they're doing really well. Yes, yeah, so so I also, so this spring I, well basically last fall I allowed the the grain to fall on the ground. I didn't allow it. It just does it all by itself. But 
so I didn't till them under in the fall, and so there's a nice stands of the of all three of those varieties growing this spring. So there'll be some winter hardy varieties coming out of the trials as well. Wow, nice. Well, I have this picture behind me of what I thought was just one variation of the Hopi purple string bean. I started selecting these. I don't know if you, you won't, well, you might see those kind of cocoa colored ones. So at first I thought that it was just moving, I don't know, backwards in time or something to bring out all these colors because I only planted the cocoa. It almost looks like a yellow in this picture with the dark purple. And I very meticulously just planted those in this one um, small bed of uh, for beans. And this is what came from just the cocoa ones. And so my question, all of these came from just that color selection. Now I'm thinking maybe I had a cross with the Indian woman yellow and the Hopi purple. But Joseph, do you have any thoughts on what's going on here? They look like hybrids to me. <laughs> right. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm proud. You know, I was like, what the heck is going on here? But I guess that's what was going on. And and then you can see, of course, that the pods are also all different colors. But so there's one of my accidental playful plant breeding experience experiments. Does anybody else have something? We had Greg saying how much he loves that and wanted to see if you'd send him some seed. Of course. <laughs> I'd love to share them. I decided to call them on the fly. We just had an article about seed sharing here in Mancus and uh, she wanted some photos. So I decided to call them Mardi Gras, Mancus Mardi Gras beans. So I would love to share those. I know people are experimenting out there with playful plant breeding. Anyone? Mel, what about you? Yeah, I was gonna, I have a question and then a comment. So Joseph or anyone, do you ever do hand pollinating of things if you want to ensure a cross or are you mostly just letting them play with each other in the field as they want to? So I have done a little bit of hand pollinating, like I did some on peas and some on tomatoes. And the reason for that is I wanted a specific cross with specific parents. Um, and, and so I, I have done a little hand pollination. Uh, hand pollination with corn is really easy. And I, I've done a little bit of that. So I'm going to try something this fall. I have a, an obsession with cow peas in the southeast here. They're incredible. And I have so many varieties and some of them are, you know, I don't have too many of in a certain quantity and I don't know a ton about them. So I'm not super married to them as they are individually. And so I'm like, hell with it. They're all going to go in the field together and I'm going to see what happens and just start doing what Joseph's doing and find the best ones, the best flavor that produce the best. So thank Sweet. you for that inspiration to let it go because I am definitely a scientist at heart, but more of an artist. And so I also get caught up in like, oh, I'm not taking good enough notes. or I'm spending too much time documenting all of this instead of just, you know, enjoying it and watching it go. So that's well, Melissa, I, I think, I think that doing that is actually more scientific right now. <laughs> It's just for yeah. it's just for a different goal, you know. If yeah, the goal true. is to divide the world up and to, you know, find you know extreme uniformity and predictability, then, you know, what we've all been taught up to now is perfectly okay. It's the way to do it. But if we that's then re resulted in the loss of so much diversity to the point where our food system is threatened, and now you know we're under even more pressure probably to rebuild local food systems that are grounded in varieties that or actually adapted there, then it's more scientific to go back and do it the other way. We still have to, you still have to select, be out there probably to, um, you know, harvest and clean and bring in the ones. And as Joseph said, maybe the most important filter that we have now is flavor, you know, find those things that we really, really like before we pass them on. So 
So it's really, I'd just like to think, you know, we've got to understand that science is broader than the weapon that's being used right now, politically, mm -hmm. especially on both sides. It's always been more open-ended and playful and challenging. You know, I think it is scientific to, to, uh, to uh, just let it go. And as, as uh, Liam was saying, you know, these evolutionary breeding projects and grains are proving that. We had, I met a gentleman who worked at the uh, National Seed Storage Lab uh, grain um, repository in Aberdeen, Idaho for 20 years. And before he left, he had over a 20 year period um, selected out a thousand grains that he thought were most heat um, tolerant. It would grow in the desert because he was from Phoenix. And when he retired, he went back to Phoenix and he had a 50 pound bag it was 20 years of just picking through things and hearing things out of, yeah, I think they have 130,000 accessions of grains at the laboratory. And so he brought back a thousand of them and planted them and then, um, and harvested what worked in Phoenix. And it was immediately that weeded out about 800 of them, right? He just never came, but he didn't know what they were. And then the next year, there were about 50 varieties. And, and so when I met him, he was two or three years into it. And I said, well, you know where this is going? And he just goes, yeah, I'm going to find the two or three things that work the best here out of that whole collection in Idaho. And I didn't, I'm, I'm by myself. I don't have a staff. I can't do a professional trials. And then I said, but how do you know what they are? And he said, Bill, that's what universities are for. <laughs> Take them back and let them <laughs> key them out and tell you what the names are. They're really good at that, but it's really shortcuts that whole process. And so that's what Occidental Arts and the colleague, what they started with 2000 varieties. In fact, somebody at Aberdeen gave them, made that mix up for them. So this idea is now going around. We don't have time for everybody to grow and keep care of their own grain. We need to find the ones that work. And the only way to do that is to plant a lot of stuff. And so in my own experiment for that, I planted 60. I had 60 things for Leanne and the in the seed summit and I'm always just kind of bringing home orphans <clears throat> and I put them all in one bag 60 different kinds of grains and I planted them here uh, two summers ago and I was a little late and it got hot really early and nothing came up or the stuff the first uh, range of things that came up got eaten by the bunnies these little bunnies got in that so I'm looking for bunny proof right I, that's worth my justification and anyway, only one thing at the end of the year, only one thing came up and really worked. And I, first I thought it was uh, amaranth until it finally flowered in October. And it was chia that I put, I hadn't forgotten I'd put it in there. So think about what I learned for growing summer grains where I am in Arizona, it doesn't work except for chia. So, that, mm -hmm. so I'm growing chia in the summers here now and all my other grains I grow in the winter and they all work in the winter. I mean, I could have been here a lifetime without figuring that out. And so playful plant breeding has a role. You know? It's like mix it all up and see what happens. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm going to do a time check here because it is seven. And before we lose everyone, do we like to kind of have um, what we call no raggedy departures? But I also wanted to mention that there's a call right now on seed libraries. Jackie, do you want to do a quick shout out on that and um she put yeah the link is if you just yeah in the chat box if you just go the zoom link is right there um hopefully people can join and talk about it we're going to be talking mostly about victory gardens and how to uh how how we're getting seeds out to people with so many closures right now so it should be a good discussion and, and that's rebecca Fern that's um leading that discussion i believe but lots of yes librarians. so if you're joining that call, um, you know, feel free to bow out as you wish. I also wonder if some people want to stay on. I should mention we have our schedule here for the next Seed Socials. Playing around with times here. I think the last one we're giving an hour and a half to, and maybe we'll give additional time in the future too if people want more time. It's really up to all of you. I see we have a couple more people that joined that we didn't get to say hi to earlier, but William and James, thanks for also joining us. And um, Maybe I'll do, what, else, what I'm going to try here is a quick, um, oh, a, how about a quick, if you're going to stay on and you want to say something you're selecting for, 
as kind of a wrap up and then folks that want to stay on and keep chatting are welcome to. Could we try that? Maybe it's like a quick round robin and everybody says it really quickly. I'm going to say your name. <laughs> Ready, set, go. Phil, you're next to me. What are you selecting for? Oh, uh, flavor. <laughs> okay, Joseph. Promiscuous tomatoes. Mm -hmm. yes. Jackie. Uh, tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. Nice. Mel, Melissa. Um, I'm making up a new word for my cow peas, badassery. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Greg. Nice. More blues in the runner beans. More blues. Renee. Cherry tomatoes. Yeah. Susanna. Hardiness. Hardiness. William, do you want to share something you're selecting for? I think I know one thing you used to select for was color. Oh, yeah, we got kids. <laughs> uh, well, I do like the color blue. Blue. Nice. Oh, I lost where I'm at. Uh, James. Uh, malting characteristics. Ooh, oh. we'd love to talk with you about that. I need to learn. Cool. Thank you. Um, does it feel right that if people, Joseph, do you have a couple more minutes? If you, you know, I have an idea for an ending. I just yeah, keep, tell me. Um, have Joseph sing another song. Okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> Go that for it. That was my round <laughs> ending that we do at Seed Schools. I wanted to try that, so thanks for doing that. But Joseph, could you do that for us? Sure. Joseph hey. um, is completing his training as a yoga teacher trainer. And, and related to me that what he had a major breakthrough recently when he was called upon. <laughs> so I'm calling upon you. <laughs> I, I totally got this, Bill. <laughs> so I, I believe, Leanne, that this is the song I sing for you at, at the Seed Summit, and I'll sing it again. Great. Love, 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 people we are made for love, love each other as ourselves, for we are one. Love, 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 people we are made for love, love each other Beautiful. Thank you. I think we all sing together on that a little bit at the Seed Summit. Can I share some quick art before you all go? I was just doodling while we were talking and I forgot I had, let me see if I can switch this camera around. I like the flower that you have. Oh, too. hold on. What's going on? Oh, I did the background. Sorry. Let me get rid of that. It's distracting. Okay. Oh my gosh. What is that? Beans. Oh my gosh. I love it. I'm just playing around with watercolors. I really don't know what I'm doing, but the fun Beautiful. thing about beans is you can just do whatever. Anyways. There you what go. a great metaphor yeah. for plant breeding. I'm just screwing right. around. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm around. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's beautiful. How appropriate. Hey everybody, this has been really wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Please come next week. We love to have you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. And William, thanks for bringing your, your kiddo. But that was fun to have a little glimpse there. I think when we met you at, at grain school, you, I'm not sure that he was even born. Thanks, you all. Take care out there, and we'll see you next time.